Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Linda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and the title of my message today is Episode 2 of Answering Persecution, Some of the Ways We Answer It. Before we start, I want to recap a couple of important points from Episode 1, where we talked about persecution and martyrdom. One is the definition of persecution which is hostility or ill treatment, especially because of race or political or religious beliefs, persistent annoyance or harassment. True martyrdom is being a witness of the truth. When persecution is very severe and extreme, it can lead to martyrdom, where someone, whether it's someone in our country or someone from ISIS or from wherever, says you either deny Jesus or you're going to die. And if we know that that's coming, we should be prepared with an answer, should we not? True martyrdom is being a witness of the truth. Martyrs die because they refuse to deny the truth. They're unwilling to force their ways upon others, and they're unwilling to fight back when fighting back would deny the love they are trying to show to those hurting them. Okay. I repeat those two things because I want y'all to remember what persecution is and what martyrdom is. Because I want you to recognize if somebody's calling somebody a martyr and they're not, I want you to recognize what is and what isn't, okay? If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We know that hatred comes from Satan. Persecution is him wearing down the saints. Martyrdom happens when his last, he makes his last desperate attempt to steal your salvation away because he can never be saved. So he's really jealous that we can. Though no one wants to be arrested or imprisoned or or persecuted for their faith, other shining examples have gone before us. And we need to look at some of those. And we have to consider, if this happens to us, that it's possible the Lord has a purpose for it, for the kingdom. I think in all that's coming, we have to keep in mind Revelation twelve eleven. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death, unto the death. This means that you stop loving and trying to cling to your life. If you love your life, When this happens, or if this happens to you, you will try to save your life, no matter what you have to say or what you have to do. And by saving your life, you'll lose your eternal salvation, okay? I want to read you the story of a famous martyr named Polycarp. He was very old. He said on the day that he was ordered to burn incense to the emperor of Rome, and he refused, that he had served the Lord for 86 years. So he was old. Polycarp is recorded as saying on the day of his death, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. This could indicate either that he was then 86 years old, or that he had lived 86 years after he gave his heart to the Lord. Polycarp goes on to say, How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? You threaten me with a fire that burns for a season, and after a little while is quenched. But you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. Polycarp was burned at the stake and pierced with a spear for refusing to burn incense to the Roman emperor. On his farewell, he said, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour, so that in the company of the martyrs I may share the cup of Christ. And I wanted to bring one point out, too. It is possible to endure even years of torture. In fact, anyone who's been a battered wife for years will tell you that that is the truth. Richard Wormbrand and his wife Sabina did endure years of torture. Their story can be found at 
www.persecution.com slash founders. They are the founders of a ministry called Voice of the Martyrs. And he was tortured for 14 years in his homeland of Romania. And when he was finally released, he wrote a book called Tortured for Christ, or Tortured for Christ is his story. I guess he wrote it. I read it years ago. It's very, very moving. And it tells the whole story of what happened. And after his release, he continued. He's, he's a, he was a Christian minister of Jewish descent, and he continued to minister until his death some years ago. We have to remember that persecution is the devil's idea, and it's his desperate attempt to make you give up your walk with Jesus. If, you're, if you come to a point where you're being persecuted, it's because you're doing a lot of good for the kingdom of God, and you're doing a lot of harm to the kingdom of darkness, and the devil don't like it. Okay, So remember, it's not the people who persecute us. It's Satan. He's just using the people because they're weak. Persecution is what brings true revival. We all know there's at least one really big revival that will come before the end. The persecution and death of Jesus brought the revival that we read about in Acts. If you realize, truly realize that we are speeding towards the end of days right now, and we're almost there, and that you probably won't get out of this thing alive unless, you know, the rapture happens and you're translated out, then, you know, once the mark comes out, none of us are getting out of it alive. I'm sure of that. I think it makes it easier not to love your life and try to fight for it, you know? Okay, so let's look at some cases of persecution in the Bible so we can understand the history of what we're studying. Stephen the deacon was considered the first martyr, but it seems to me like John the Baptist was the very first, having basically died for preaching against adultery to Herod Agrippa. When I was researching, I found a site called franciscanmedia.org that tells the story of John's death very eloquently, so I'm going to read from that. The drunken oath of a king with a shallow sense of honor, a seductive dance, and the hateful heart of a queen combined to bring about the martyrdom of John the Baptist. The greatest of prophets suffered the fate of so many Old Testament prophets before him, rejection and martyrdom. The voice crying in the desert did not hesitate to accuse the guilty, did not hesitate to speak the truth. But why? What possesses a man that he would give up his very life? This great religious reformer was sent by God to prepare the people for the Messiah. His vocation was one of selfless giving. The only power that he claimed was the spirit of Yahweh. I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Scripture tells us that many people followed John, looking to him for hope, perhaps in anticipation of some great messianic power. John never allowed himself the false honor of receiving these people for his own glory. He knew his calling was one of preparation. When the time came, he led his disciples to Jesus. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. It is John the Baptist who has pointed the way to Christ. John's life and death were a giving over of self for God and other people. His simple style of life was one of complete detachment from earthly possessions. His heart was centered on God and the call that he heard from the Spirit of God speaking to his heart. Confident of God's grace, he had the courage to speak words of condemnation, repentance, and salvation. Okay, now I'm going to read some from another site. According to the Synoptic Gospels, Herod, this is Herod Antipas, who was tetrarch or sub-king of Galilee under the Roman Empire, had imprisoned John the Baptist because he reproved Herod for divorcing his wife, Basilus, daughter of King Aretas of Nebataea, and unlawfully taking Herodias, the wife of his brother Herod Philip I. On Herod's birthday, Herodias' daughter, whom Josephus identifies at Salome, danced before the king and his guests. Her dancing pleased Herod so much that in his drunkenness he promised to give her anything she desired, 
up to half of his kingdom. When Salome asked her mother what she should request, she was told to ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Although Herod was appalled by the request, he reluctantly agreed and had John executed in the prison. In the Antiquities of the Jews, Book 18, Josephus confirms that Herod Antipas slew John the Baptist after imprisoning him at Machiris because he feared John's influence might enable him to start a rebellion. So this part is very interesting. Historian Flavius Josephus also relates in his Antiquities of the Jews that Herod killed John, stating that he did so lest the great influence John had over the people might put it into his John's power and inclination to raise a rebellion, for they seemed ready to do anything he should advise. So Herod thought it best to put him to death. So in that way, he might not have been a martyr. So that may be why he's not called a martyr. Okay. None of the sources give an exact date, which was probably in the years 28-29 A.D. So how did John the Baptist respond to persecution? We are not really told, but he was surely aware if he preached the truth about sin to Herod that it would cost him. So I think in the face of persecution, John spoke the truth of God's word anyway. Okay, Stephen. Looking at Wikipedia, I found some interesting information about Stephen. Stephen, the Greek Stephanos, I think is how you say that, meaning wreath, crown, or by extension, reward, honor, renown, or fame often given as a title rather than a name. Tra traditionally venerated as the proto-martyr or first martyr of Christianity, was according to the Acts of the Apostles a deacon in the early church at Jerusalem who aroused the enmity of members of various synagogues by his teaching. He was accused of blasphemy, like Jesus. At his trial, he made a speech denouncing the Jewish authorities who were sitting in judgment on him and was then stoned to death, also like Jesus. Um, and being stoned to death for denouncing. His martyrdom was witnessed by Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee who would later become a follower of Jesus and become known as Paul the Apostle. I wonder if Stephen's stoning had anything to do with that. The only primary source for information about Stephen is the New Testament book of the Acts of the Apostles. Stephen is mentioned in Acts 6 as one of the Greek-speaking Hellenistic Jews selected to participate in a fair distribution of welfare to the Greek-speaking widows. This shows he was known as a man of integrity. I don't know if y'all have noticed lately in our world, but integrity is in scarce supply these days. It is so rare to find anyone who walks in integrity, who does the right thing, even if it costs them something. Acts 6-5 calls Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Further down in chapter 6, it also says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council, just like they did Jesus, y'all. And set up false witnesses, just like they did for Jesus, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And the Pharisees kind of worshipped Moses. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as if it had been the face of an angel. Then Stephen proceeded to preach to them a beautiful anointed sermon about Moses. And they were Jews, so they revered Moses. And he was showing kind of, I think, that he did too in that sermon. And that sermon ended in Acts 7 with, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. <laughs> he had courage. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which shewed before of the coming of the just one of whom you have now 
you have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And verse 60, the next verse tells us how Stephen answered persecution. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen's story encourages more than anyone's because I think after he asked the Lord to forgive his attackers, like Jesus did, then the Lord just put him into a deep sleep like they put you in before you have surgery. So he didn't feel the rest of the pain of the stoning. And I think we need to remember that. Should we face persecution and be staring down the barrel at martyrdom, I think we need to remember to pray and out loud for our attackers. Y'all remember that this is very important and then maybe God will just take the pain away. I believe that he does for many martyrs because there are stories. And I couldn't find one that I wanted to read y'all that was about a man that was stoned way, way, way. I don't even know how many centuries ago. And they, they sentenced him to lay down on a bed of nails or something like that. And so he got on the nails and he turned over on his side and put his, his hands up under his head like he was going to sleep, like it was a pillow. And he wasn't even reacting to the pain, so he didn't feel the pain. So let that encourage you. Stephen's death was followed by the death of James, the brother of John. Tradition says that all of the 12 apostles were martyred except for John. Others who were martyred included Mark, Barnabas, James, the Lord's brother, and Paul. James was one of the first disciples to join Jesus. The Synoptic Gospels state that James and John were with their father by the seashore when Jesus called them to follow him. James was one of only three apostles whom Jesus selected to bear witness to his transfiguration. Acts of the Apostles records that Herod the king, which is Herod Agrippa, had James executed by the sword. It is believed in A.D. 44. Some suggest that this may have been caused by James's fiery temper, for which he and his brother earned the nickname Sons of Thunder. Uh, these James and John were the sons of Zebedee that asked Jesus if they could sit on his right hand and his left when he came into the kingdom. Remember that story from the Gospels? That's this one. They really did not understand he was the son of God, the Messiah, when they asked that. No one enjoys suffering. No one. Most people across the globe, however, recognize that suffering is normal in this fallen world. Our culture in America has glorified comfort and convenience almost to the point of entitlement. Some of the teachings going around the around would have you think that the Lord always wants you supremely happy, comfortable, healthy, wealthy, and wise. But that really does not line up with what the Bible says. We are promised that all those who live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. So there's one right there. Persecution and martyrdom which is sometimes the result in cases of extreme persecution, is a distant thought to the majority of us here in America. Since we Christians who really try to live for the Lord have a much clearer idea of the lateness of the hour, it is not quite as strange to us. I don't want it to be foreign to you as we know this is coming to us in America. And we all hope that God does the catching away before that and we're out of here, but, but we don't know for sure about that. I want all of you to be prepared when it shows up, okay? I want you to be prepared. My whole purpose in doing this series is to prepare you in case you are one of the ones that faces persecution and or martyrdom. I want you to be ready. I want you to know how you're going to answer. I want you to know how some of the people in the past answered. That's why I'm doing this series. Because persecution isn't just something distant from us anymore. It's here. It's in our country and it's going to become very widespread. 
okay? Let us not be ignorant of Satan's devices. Let us truly not be ignorant of Satan's devices. He will try anything to get us to give up our faith. He will try anything to get us to deny Jesus because then he gets our soul. You can't repent after you do that. Okay, if you deny Jesus when you're facing martyrdom, you're done. Just telling you. Because Revelation talks about what happens to the people who do that. You must be willing to give up anything rather than that, rather than deny Jesus. Literally, anything or anyone, but not your faith in the Lord if you're going to make it to heaven. It's really not common to hear a message on suffering in churches in America. But the Bible regards suffering as normal. Part of this suffering comes from the fact that we live in a fallen world. And this kind of suffering falls on Christians and non-Christians alike. The first followers of Jesus consistently experienced suffering for the sake of Jesus. When they were in Jerusalem, in Galatia, in Philippi, in Thessalonica and in Asia Minor. So, you know, Paul went through horrible suffering. I think Peter did too. Paul was quite explicit in saying this was to be expected by everyone who follows Jesus. In the Bible, suffering and opposition are a normal part of a normal Christian life. We just aren't used to it today. In America, (laughs) yeah, The comfort we experience as Christians in the West has actually been an anomaly compared to many other countries. Because of our Christian heritage, combined with the democratic freedom and the laws protecting our freedoms that we could once upon a time count on but can no longer, we Christians in the West have heretofore been, for the most part, left alone with our faith. But as you can see, that has changed and we're no longer safe with it. So you have to prepare yourself for what follows. You know, there is a large body of Christians in the world today, especially here in America, that when the law is passed that makes Christianity a crime, they honestly won't have to worry about it because there's not even enough evidence of being a Christian in their lives to convict them. And y'all know I'm talking about the lukewarm. The only evidence in their lives that they're a Christian is they own a Bible, which they'll throw away when this happens. And they might show up at church three times a year or or maybe even every Sunday. And they're no more Christian than your doorknob. There's no other evidence in their life. That's not a true Christian, y'all. You can't be a true Christian and live like the devil. Can I just tell you that? You can't be a true Christian and worship your wealth because those are not complimentary woe to them when Jesus returns because they will be left behind and if y'all think it's bad now the great tribulation will be a thousand ten thousand times worse woe to them on the day of judgment because they have no real belief or faith and a fiery eternity awaits them all right so We looked at three people and how they answered persecution. We looked at Polycarp, who was a whole lot like Jesus. And he said, I'm not going to deny him no matter what. Polycarp told his torturers that, you know, you threaten me with fire that burns for a season. But I would rather have that than, you know, the fire that burns forever. And he thanked God for the privilege that when he got to heaven, he would be able to share the cup with the other martyrs. John the Baptist, who a lot of people don't consider a martyr, but I kind of do because he was arrested for preaching the truth. But John just kept on preaching. So if he was a martyr, that's how he answered. And Stephen asked for his attackers to be forgiven. And I think we need to hold on to the picture of Stephen doing that. Can you imagine what that was like? Standing back. And you're watching people hurl these huge stones to kill this man. Just watching it, that's so barbaric. Watching them try to hit him in the head, to crush his head, to kill him with these stones. And he cries out in a loud voice, Father, please forgive him because they don't know what they're doing. And you realize you're holding a stone when he says it. 
should we ourselves face martyrdom? Whenever that last day comes, may we remember all of these other people who faced it before us. And may we remember that the cross was Jesus' worst fear, but it was also his greatest triumph. That's all I have for y'all today. Jesus bless you. Thanks for listening. Y'all have a great weekend. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 60, Glencoe, Arkansas, 72539, or by email at jphtoday at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination. Have you ever gone through a time in your life where suddenly it just felt like your whole life was falling apart? I call these experiences the wilderness experiences. Wilderness experiences are a time of great uncertainty and change. Uh, There are times when our faith is tried and refined. After many experiences, the Lord spoke to me to write The Wilderness Companion, which is a virtual roadmap through the desert times of your life. Find out why you've been led to the wilderness. Find out what the biggest hindrance is to receiving provision in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Drastically cut the time you spend in the wilderness by learning how to partner with the Lord instead of working against Him. Every Christian needs to read The Wilderness Companion. It's by Glenda Lomax, and it's available on Amazon.com or WingsOfProphecy.com. Amazon.com, The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax. Have you heard? The 2016 and 2017 messages have been published in book form. Even those who do not profess a belief in God can see something is amiss in the world around us. What is coming for our world in these last days? What does the Lord want us doing while we're waiting for His glorious reappearance? Time of Reckoning and Soon It Will Be Night each contain approximately 200 prophetic messages and visions from the throne room of God telling what is coming to America and the world in these end times. The Lord has always warned nations when they were headed for destruction. He has always warned His own people. Are we also being warned? Get your copy of Time of Reckoning and Soon It Will Be Night, available now on Amazon.com. What is in store for the once great and mighty nation of America in these end times? What is the living God saying to the people of America now? What could possibly be in store for a nation that once trusted in God, but has changed its path from following in the living God's ways to now removing Him from everything and walking the other way? In the book, No Longer Mind, you will find all the messages to America collected in one place in chronological order. No Longer Mind, Messages to an Unrepentant Nation is now available in print at wingsofprophecy.com in the bookstore tab. Get your copy of No Longer Mind today.